In this module, we're going to explore the uses of ultrasound to investigate the lung and pleura. Ultrasound technology has been used since the early 1960s to detect large pleural effusions. Early medical ultrasonographers recognized that when they saw large collections of poorly echogenic matter in the chest, that this was likely not a normal finding due to the poor visualization of air-filled structures using ultrasound. They inferred and used empiric testing and thoracentesis to confirm that these were collections of fluid in the pleural space, and thus ultrasound began to be used to diagnose pleural effusions. And that's it, right? The history of lung ultrasound should pretty much stop there. We know air doesn't transmit ultrasound waves well, so using ultrasound to visualize two large air-filled spaces in the chest doesn't seem like it would lead to great visualization or any helpful clinical findings, right? Well, not exactly. So just like we no longer believe that holding suspiciously large newborns upside down and spanking them is modern medicine, the field of pulmonary ultrasound has also grown in recent years. At the core of this expansion of the field was the deeper exploration of this belief that just because air disrupts visualization using ultrasound waves, there are still many helpful pieces of information that can be gained by looking at the transition point between tissues that are not air, such as the skin, the subcutaneous tissue, connective tissue, the ribs, the muscles, the fascia, the pleura, and air, which should be present in the healthy lung parenchyma in a regular patient. The growth of lung ultrasound like many ultrasound uses, arose in the ICU, primarily due to the work and research of the French intensivist Dr. Daniel Lichtenstein. What started as curiosity has now expanded into volumes of pulmonary textbooks, a number of practice-changing publications, and has helped develop protocols that are found in every single point-of-care ultrasound manual you can find. So what does the evidence say about the use of lung ultrasound? Well, for nearly every common diagnosis considered in patients with respiratory complaints, lung ultrasound has been shown to be superior than chest x-ray, which is where most of our brains jump when we think about pulmonary disorders. So if we took 100 patients with respiratory complaints for these diagnoses and subjected all of those patients to an x-ray, a lung ultrasound, and a CT scan as the confirmation study, the sensitivity for lung ultrasound to pick up on effusions, pneumonias, pulmonary edema, and pneumothorax is as high as double that of a chest x-ray. Now there's a lot of reasons for this. X-rays vary in quality. CT scans probably over-detect and over-diagnose problems in subclinical presentations. But the takeaway here is that whenever you think about ordering a chest x-ray, I want you to start thinking about whether or not a lung ultrasound could save your patient time, money, and be a better test when the diagnosis may be uncertain. Just to hit this home, the growing body of literature for lung ultrasound seems to support the claim that a lung ultrasound is equivalent, diagnostically speaking at least, to a CT scan. You can get much of the same information that you would normally get from a CT scan by doing POCUS without the radiation, without overburdening a busy radiologist, without waiting for the scan and the interpretation to be performed, and without the cost associated with those studies. All right, I'm beating a dead horse, so let's move on. Central to utilizing lung ultrasound is understanding how to properly perform an exam. So let's talk through how this is done. Our probe of choice for lung ultrasound is actually a couple of probes. While any can be used, I think most commonly, I reach for the linear probe and the phased array probe. The linear probe, with its high resolution but poor ultrasound penetration into deeper structures, is ideal for looking at the pleural line or the fluid air interface. Accordingly, this is the best probe to look for disruptions in that interface as might be seen in a pneumothorax, for example. I also reach for this probe in the newborn nursery or in the emergency room when evaluating dyspneic newborns, kids, or otherwise slim patients who don't have a lot of subcutaneous tissue overlying the thoracic cavity. The phased array probe has the benefit of penetrating deeper into the chest, and for this reason can be used to look at the lung parenchyma when there is fluid or consolidation, such as pneumonia or pleural effusions. The phased array probe also has the added benefit of a smaller footprint, so it's easier to slide in between the ribs at intercostal spaces, or it can also be used when performing EFAST exams or other protocols that look at both abdominal and thoracic structures without having to change probes or machine settings. As we'll discuss later, the interpretation of lung ultrasound depends largely on generating artifact, and so for this reason, it's important to hold the probe perpendicularly to the skin and the pleural line to allow the machine to generate these artifacts. 
the probe should be placed over an intercostal space perpendicular with the gain turned to a mid-low gain setting. You might be tempted to use the machine's lung preset setting if your machine has one. And while sometimes that will result in a good image, most experienced ultrasonographers will actually use the abdominal setting for the majority of their lung scans. This is because that setting doesn't mess around much with the computer and the technology behind uh, the, the scenes that generates the images we see on our displays. You don't need to know the specifics of why this is, but just know that the less you mess with the coding and the less you mess with all those fancy settings, the better your lung ultrasound is going to be at giving you diagnostic information. The depth setting for the machine is largely individualized to the patient and disease that you're looking at, but generally eight to 15 centimeters of depth will be adequate to visualize most patients when using the face array probe. Recall that lungs are paired organs that are asymmetrically divided into three lobes on the right and two lobes plus a lingula on the left. If you Google how to do lung ultrasound, you'll find dozens of different recommendations that vary quite a bit in where they suggest you look at the lungs with an ultrasound probe. Some people advocate for symptom-directed scans that really only look at the areas of the lung expected to have problems, which most commonly includes the lung bases along the posterior lateral chest wall. Other people recommend a more sequenced or full exam, looking at 12 different zones of two to three intercostal spaces across both sides of the chest. In my experience, I generally tend to scan in six zones that roughly approximate the anatomy of the lungs. The anterior fields best visualize the upper lobes of the lungs. The lateral fields see the right middle lobe and lateral aspects of the right lung, as well as the lingula and lateral side of the left lung on the left. And the posterior fields look at both lower lobes. Whatever you do in your future practice, I'd encourage you to have one, a standardized approach to collecting these images, and two, be mindful of the clinical question that you're asking. If you're looking for a lobar pneumonia, make sure to investigate every lobe. But if you're looking for a pneumothorax, remember that air will be anti-dependent and fluid will be gravity dependent, provided there are no structural limitations to its flow. We'll talk about this more when examining the different lung pathology and the rest of the module. To that end, let's go over what normal, well-aerated lungs look like on ultrasound. I mentioned earlier that the acquisition and interpretation of lung ultrasound images relies on understanding the, that we rely on artifacts generated by the machine. So if you'll permit me, I want to review a couple of slides that we went over in our very first module that are key to understanding the physics behind lung ultrasound. I promise this will be brief, but if you're struggling with understanding, go back and review these lectures from the first module. The first key to review is that sound waves propagate or move through tissue based on properties inherent to that tissue itself. The takeaway point here is that some tissues like fluid or subcutaneous fat, connective tissue, etc., will conduct ultrasounds easily and that air will not. Whenever ultrasound waves encounter a change in the type of media through which they're moving, like for example, when they travel through the sub-Q and then reach the thoracic cavity and encounter lungs that are filled with air, that boundary between these two media will cause some waves to pass through and some waves to be reflected back. These reflections back are the echoes that show up as bright lines on our ultrasound displays. Because of all of these reflecting properties, I also want to review the artifact called reverberation artifact. The classic example seen here is when a hollow needle is brought into the plane of ultrasound waves and the echoes are reflected back and forth within the needle before being transmitted or reflected back up to the transducer. So here we have a hollow needle and ultrasound waves coming in. And while some of those will pass through and generate echoes deep to the needle, the others will sometimes get reflected back inside of that hollow needle. Some will go back up to the probe and some will continue to reflect or reverberate inside between those two highly reflective structures. This generates a phantom image at parallel lengths that uh, is a, displayed at increasing depth parallel to the original inciting structures. Remember that the depth of structures on the screen is plotted as a function of time that it takes for those echoes to be received. So because the machine gets these echoes that come back after reverberating within the needle, the machine thinks that there's another reflecting structure deep to the needle, which results in these ghostly reverberations below in the image. This concept will also play out in lung ultrasonography. This professional level sketch of the anatomy of the thoracic wall, you can thank me later for my artistic skills, 
highlights the central idea that lung ultrasound is, in many ways, really just pleural ultrasound. Because normally, we're not going to get signal coming back from below the pleural line because all of those waves will be scattered or absorbed by the lung tissue and the air inside. Also, recall that the pleura is formed by two oppositional layers of connective tissue. The parietal pleura, here in yellow, lies the, uh, or lines the innermost layer of the thoracic cage, while the visceral pleura lies over the lung parenchyma. In really simplistic terms, let's see how reverberation artifact manifests in lung ultrasound. So here is another sketch of the thoracic wall, again further simplified into layers of things that are not air, aka things that conduct ultrasound waves readily, and things that are air, like the lung parenchyma, that don't readily permit propagation of ultrasound waves. So at the top we have an ultrasound transducer, which I'll highlight here for you. And then we see that our probe indicator is on the left, and we see that we've got a gel base here, and we're ready to start insinating our patients with these ultrasound waves. So as these incoming yellow waves contact the rib and the pleura, both at places where the impedance of the tissue changes markedly, we get a strong set of echoes that bounce back up to the probe and are sensed, resulting in a bright, highly echogenic line along the rib surface and the pleural line. Additionally, a small amount of energy is scattered by the air and lungs, and this results in the generation of this highly echogenic line with some uh, hyperechoic uh, densities, some heterogeneity here in the subcutaneous tissue, but we see this rib and this pleural line here that are brightly echogenic. While some of those ultrasound waves that return up to the probe can be absorbed by the probe, a lot of them are actually reflected back off of the probe and go back down into the lung again. So for this reason, returning waves will continue to reflect back down to the pleural line and lose a little bit of energy in the process, mainly repeating the cycle. As this pattern continues, the machine senses echoes returning at regular intervals, and due to the reverberation artifact, the machine plots phantom pleural lines deep to the pleural line, which we could see here and here. While you can get reverberation artifact with some bony configurations as well, it's much more common to see a lack of image or acoustic shadowing uh, where you won't get these, uh, these reverberation artifacts because a very high proportion of that wave energy is reflected back to the probe as opposed to the loss of energy that occurs when the uh, waves are scattered by the lung tissue. So now that we know what to expect when we look at normal lung based on reverberation artifact, let's go ahead and see a static image of a healthy aerated lung using real ultrasound. So what we see here is that as predicted, we have a bright echogenic pleural line, a rib off to the side with acoustic shadowing underneath, and then these parallel lines that represent reverberation artifact between the transducer and the pleural line. These lines have a special name called A-lines. A-lines imply the existence of a well-inflated lung, but they don't rule out ventilation and perfusion mismatches, small areas of focal findings, or small volume pneumothoraces. So here's some ways that I can kind of help you remember what A-lines are. So I've got a picture of some A-lines and I've highlighted those parallel uh, waves across. Um, so one teacher that I had when they were teaching me said that you can remember A-lines because they run parallel across just like the crossbar on a capital letter A. Uh, whether or not that's a helpful mnemonic for you, um, that's one way that you can remember them. Uh, another thing that you can say is that A is equivalent to air. Um, and while we'll talk in the next lecture about how that may not always be true, it does imply that there is something like air underneath the fluid um, or underneath the pleural line because fluid would otherwise conduct those ultrasound waves well. And then lastly, A stands for A-OK -okay or A+, plus because it's what we expect to see in a healthy, normal lung. So now that we can identify normal lung, let's think about some focus scenarios that we may run across in clinic or at the hospital that change the architecture, impedance, or function of the lung in the pleura. And that's exactly what we're going to look at in the next two lessons in this module. Namely, we're going to ask these questions. How do typical pathologies affect the pleural interface and thus change the ways ultrasound might be able to visualize them?
In this introduction to lung ultrasound, we touched on the history of lung ultrasound, how it has evolved from being what was considered an extremely limited diagnostic tool to now having roughly the same sensitivity as a CT scan for a variety of pulmonary and pleural pathologies. We talked about some exam technique and the optimal machine settings that give us the artifact we need to infer the overall health of the lungs, even if we can't visualize them directly. We also saw examples of what normal lung looks like using ultrasound, including the concept of A-lines. In our next lesson, we'll start to see what happens when all of this breaks down.